to you from the Forge of Freedom studio in the heart of America, a podcast dedicated to preserving freedom and inspiring personal success. Freedom is born and lives through you, the individual, and it dies in the shadows of tyranny. Motivating our listeners to become well-rounded, freedom-minded people with the body of an athlete, the mind of a stoic, and the spirit of a warrior. The Tree of Liberty lives on through you, the Forge of Freedom. And now, here's your host, Alex Uli. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Forge of Freedom podcast. I'm your host, Alex Uli, and this is episode 18 of the Forge of Freedom. For those of you who have been listening uh, to the previous episodes, you you certainly noticed that the introduction changed a little bit. We got a, a new, uh, shiny, fancy introduction. I'm trying to streamline the introduction a little bit so that you don't listen to me uh, repeating the same intro every week. So I hope you like that. Um, going to try to improve the podcast, the intro, the outro as we go. Uh, and that's just uh, w- one thing we've done recently. But nevertheless... I'm the same guy you listened to last week, and let's get into the topic for today. Why would an innocent person plead guilty? This is a topic that I think about frequently in my day-to-day job as an attorney, and having had significant involvement in the criminal justice system, I see this as a persistent problem uh, at the federal level and at the state level. So I want to talk a little bit about it. I don't. I don't think people realize how widespread a problem this this is. You know, I hear a lot of people, especially when I'm talking to them about my my job, they'll they'll say, "Well, if they're innocent, then I would. If I were innocent, I would never plead guilty." And I think that people underestimate the power and the leverage. That the system can impose, the criminal justice system can impose on, on a person, on an individual. Because when it's when it's you that's been accused of a crime, it, it's you versus the state of wherever you are, or you versus the United States. Uh, so it, it's a pretty pretty large discrepancy there in terms of power. Um, so there are lots of things that can uh, influence a person, and often do influence people to take guilty pleas when they're truly innocent or or maybe not guilty as charged. So one of the most persistent myths, as we've been talking about already, about the criminal justice system is that only guilty people plead guilty. In fact, with the coercive tools available to prosecutors, a rational choice may in fact be for an innocent person to plead guilty to a lesser charge to avoid risk of going to trial. But one might ask, if a defendant has a right to a trial by jury, why would they plead guilty? Well, there are several factors. First, prosecutors can stack charges with impunity. Defendants are frequently overcharged. So even if a defendant is guilty of something, he or she is often not guilty of everything they have been charged with. And this overcharging or stacking of charging charges is a bargaining technique that creates risk for a defendant at trial. And part of the problem here, and I've talked about qualified immunity in a previous episode, and I'll link to that episode in the show notes, but part of the problem is that prosecutors... Um, are, are entitled to uh, immunities, uh, depending on what stage of the case they are in. If it's the investigatory stage, it's in qualified immunity. If it's uh, beyond the investigatory stage, the charging stage and beyond, uh, it would be absolute immunity. So there really is no recourse for this overcharging, or very little recourse anyway. Secondly, defendants are often concerned with something commonly referred to as a trial penalty or sometimes called a trial tax. The trial penalty is a term that refers to the differential 
between what a prosecutor will offer you if you take a plea bargain and what your punishment would be if you exercise your right to a trial and you lose. Often, the sentence, if you are found guilty at trial, would be worse, sometimes far worse, than if you plead guilty. The possibility of suffering a trial penalty or a trial tax is often enough to convince someone to plead guilty, especially when coupled with the fact that many defendants are represented by public defense counsel who are often overworked and underpaid. The trial penalty is one of a a whole suite of tools available to prosecutors to induce people to waive their right to a trial and plead guilty. I should also mention that many states allow what's called an an offered plea or what is also known as a best interests plea. In this type of plea, the defendant registers or offers a formal admission of guilt to the charges in criminal court while the defendant simultaneously expresses their innocence toward the same charges. So they'll say, I'm pleading guilty, but I'm not really guilty. I'm just doing it um, because it's in my best interest to do so, to, for instance, avoid the risk of trial. This offered plea is similar to the what's called the no low no contender or no contest plea. And they're slightly different, um, but like the no contest plea, an offered plea skips the full process of a trial because the defendant agrees to accept all the ramifications of a guilty verdict, i.e. the punishment. The main difference between a no contest or a no low contender plea and an offered plea is that in an offered plea, the defendant formally pleads guilty, while in a no low contender plea, the defendant refuses to assert either guilt or innocence. This distinction is relevant because unlike a no low contender plea, a formal admission of guilt under an offered plea can be used against the defendant in future cases. But as with all plea bargains, an offer plea is not a right, and it is ultimately up to the prosecutor and the judge to decide if they will offer it or accept it. In a few states like New Jersey and Indiana, where I practice, expressly forbid offer pleas. Third, lots of people end up in jail awaiting trial. Sometimes they do not even have bail available to them. And even if they do have bail, it is often set at an amount that they cannot realistically afford. So they they are going to be stuck in jail waiting for their trial. And, And jail is a very difficult and unpleasant place to be. Obviously, that's by design. So many people will plead guilty just to get out of jail rather than waiting weeks or months for trial. Fourth, and we mentioned this earlier a little bit, uh, most people who go through uh, the criminal justice system are represented by government-funded lawyers, and the government persistently underfunds those lawyers. In fact, And in one of the counties where I practice, uh, over 90% of criminal defendants are represented by public defenders. Public defenders often carry more cases than they should. They do not always have the time to give a fully zealous representation in each of their cases. And in some jurisdictions, a defendant may not even meet their lawyer until the day of trial. It should go without saying that this is not how a zealous defense is put together. Fifth, there is a problem of over-criminalization. There are so many crimes that it is hard to keep track of all of them. In fact, it is impossible 
to know everything that is a crime. This is especially concerning because many things that are against the law are not obviously wrong. There is a distinction in the law between actions that are malum in se, which means they are inherently wrong, like murder, and actions that are malum prohibitum, that is, things that are wrong because they are prohibited. They're not inherently wrong. There's nothing wrong, for instance, about carrying a firearm without a license. It's wrong because the law says it's wrong. This overcriminalization, coupled with the vast resources of prosecutors to bring to bear on individuals, creates a situation that is antithetical to a free society. There's a book that I'd like to mention here called the, um, it's called Three Felonies a Day, How the Feds Target the Innocent, and it's a book by Harvey Silver, Silverglate. This book stands for the proposition that, uh, that there are so many laws and there is such a disconnect between morality and the law that there is no way that any of us can go about our lives without committing a crime each day, or as the title suggests, three felonies a day. And I'll take just a moment here to read the intro to the book. It says, The average professional in this country wakes up in the morning, goes to work, comes home, eats dinner, and then goes to sleep, unaware that he or she has likely committed several federal crimes that day. Why? The answer lies in the very nature of modern federal criminal laws, which have exploded in number, but also become impossibly broad and vague. In three felonies a day, Harvey Silverglate reveals how federal criminal laws have become dangerously disconnected from the English common law tradition and how prosecutors can pin arguable federal crimes on any one of us for even the most seemingly innocuous behavior. The volume of federal crimes in recent decades has increased well beyond the statute books and into the morass of the Code of Federal Regulations, handing federal prosecutors an additional trove of vague and exceedingly complex and technical prohibitions to stick on their hapless targets. The dangers spelled out in three felonies a day do not apply solely to white-collar criminals, state and local politicians, and professionals. No social class or profession is safe from this troubling form of social control by the executive branch, and nothing less than the integrity of our constitutional democracy hangs in the balance. If this book sounds like a, it might be of interest to you, you can find a link to it in the show notes. But one of the precepts of the law is that it should encourage good behavior and deter bad behavior. How can anyone comply with the law if there is such a loose connection between right and wrong and many of our laws? And as you heard there in the intro, this book focuses on federal law, but this is just as true in some states and many states with respect to state law. Finally, one last reason I'd like to discuss about why an innocent person might plead guilty. Prosecutors often threaten family members, and this is especially true in the federal system. So if they want you to take a plea and you are not interested the prosecutor says something like, well, you know what? This is a white-collar business case, and your son participated in this business for a while, didn't he? Maybe we should take a close look at him. Let's look at his income taxes. Look if he ever hired an undocumented worker. We'll just look at every single facet of his life. How do you think your son would do in prison? As shocking as it may seem, that happens frequently, as I said, especially in the federal court system. It is routine for prosecutors to threaten family members in the way that I just described, especially in the federal system. As you can see, 
there are several tools that prosecutors can wield to get someone to plead guilty, even if the person is innocent or only partly guilty. Obviously, I have not addressed every tool, like mandatory minimum sentences, for instance. But taken together, you can see that these tools add up to a very coercive dynamic. The plea bargain, as it is practiced by prosecutors, has become a tool that helps pervert justice by penalizing people who seek a jury trial and prioritizes efficiency over actual justice. All right, with all that in mind, uh, I want to tell you about an interesting study uh, as we wrap up here. This study was conducted a few years ago, and I've linked to the study in the show notes. Lucian Durvin and others conducted a study. um, It was a deception study. And this study is published in the Fordham International Law Journal. And in this study, they accused students of engaging in academic misconduct. The accused students were offered two alternatives. If they were willing to plead guilty, they would lose their compensation for participating in the study, which was akin to a plea in return for probation in the criminal justice system. If they did not plead guilty, they would proceed to a trial before an administrative review board, which was meant to represent a criminal trial. And in that context, if the student lost, a differential was created by saying that they would lose their compensation, their advisor would be informed, and they would have to attend an ethics course. So this is meant to represent the the trial penalty or the trial tax that we talked about earlier. And the study showed that approximately 89% of the participants who were guilty of the misconduct accepted the plea deal and pleaded guilty. Okay, so that doesn't sound too bad so far. But this is where it gets interesting. The study also showed that 56% of the innocent individuals also accepted the plea deal and pleaded guilty. 56% of the innocent individuals felt like the rational decision for them was to falsely plead guilty to something they had not done in the, conduct, in the context of academic misconduct. I think this, this study demonstrates a a very important concern and I think cast a lot of doubt on the accuracy of the plea bargaining system, especially with the coercive tools available to prosecutors. People often say, well, they pled guilty, they must have done it. I hope this causes you to stop and think a moment about the mechanics of our criminal justice system. The laws themselves. And think about the incentives that are present to plead guilty, even if you're innocent, before you assume the truth or accuracy of the plea bargaining system. Anyway, I hope you found this to be an interesting discussion. Um, I think it's probably worthwhile in the future to talk about mandatory minimum sentences and the reasons for them and against them, and then also maybe more about the plea bargaining system. But for now, that's where we'll leave it with this discussion about why someone who's innocent, or at least partly innocent, would plead guilty. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show, and if you if you did enjoy the show, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to help us spread the message of freedom. I look forward to talking with you again next week when I will discuss Aristotle's concept of virtue and the good life. 
Until then, remember, you are the Forge of Freedom.